Hello friends and welcome once again to Behold the Lamb Presents. I am Chris Shelton, your host. I want to thank you for joining us today. Our message is entitled, The Judgment Was Set, The Books Opened. The Bible speaks about a great day of judgment where the righteous dead and living will be judged along with the wicked dead and those who are still living wickedly. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 states, For we must all, that's all of us, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Some people, some people in this world, and you may have met them, I've met them, have the belief that everyone will go to heaven regardless of what their deeds have been, good or bad. But is that really what the Bible teaches? Why would Christ himself, have you ever thought about this? Why would he often refer to the judgment if it was of just little consequence? I don't think he would have. Should we gain a greater understanding of what the judgment is and it's all about? I hope you'll stay tuned today. I hope you'll join Pastor Kenny Shelton as he brings this inspiring message once again entitled, The Judgment Was Set, The Books Open. But before we hear from him, let's listen to a song that I hope reflects all of our desires, all of our desires of our heart, and it is entitled, Redeemed, and will be sung in the 3ABN studios by Alessandra Sirachi. Proclaim. 
thank you for joining us once again here at Behold the Lamb Ministries. Again, we always appreciate coming into your home or wherever it might be to spend, oh, we're going to just say it, round it off an hour with you in the study of God's Word. You know, can't think of anything better to do, you know, if we come to visit your home personally, we'd want to study the Word, wouldn't we? We'd want to talk, we'd want to study, we'd want to pray together and, and praise together. So praise God today we have this opportunity. And uh, I want you to get your Bible and pencil and paper and everything that you're going to need. Well, again, sometimes we, we're, we're told we move rather quickly. And so if we do, just jot down some of the passages, go back and study those. Because everybody that stands in the pulpit, and I include myself here now, look, well, I, I want you to check me out. You've got to check it out. You've got to try the spirits. You've got to see whether, you know, somebody said, well, he's a preacher. He's telling the truth. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I'm not trying to downtrod anything or anybody. But because we stand in the pulpit does not mean you're getting the truth. And we need to understand the truth, especially of this subject. The judgment was set, and notice this, and the books were opened. Very serious subject. But I pray that God will... Meet what you need where you're at right now, and I'm going to pray right now because I, I want to get down to business. I want to get down to studying the Word of God, don't you? But first of all, we need to pray together, and I'm going to kneel. You can do it if you'd like. Those of you at home, wherever you might be, just pray along with me, please. Merciful Father in heaven, we do thank you for the privilege we have of prayer and to call you our Father. Lord, I invite thy Holy Spirit to take possession of each and every one of your children today. Take possession of my mind and my heart. Forgive me of any sin, anything in my heart and life that needs not be there. Lord, we want it gone. We want to have clear communication between heaven and earth or between you and man. Bless us, Lord, we pray to this end. Hearts and minds be open right now. Lord, let's not be worrying about what we're going to do after the sun goes down. Let's not be worrying about what all is going on in the world right now. We need this time with you. Speak to us, Lord, for your servants all here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to, I'm going to read a quote as we start this. To me, it's a fascinating subject. You know, it's really, it really is fascinating because every person that's ever been born will be involved. We might say that two or three times, but it's all right. Remember, whether you want to be involved or whether you don't want to be involved, whether you call yourself a Christian or an atheist or whatever it might be, you will be involved in this subject. Every person, again, whether you like it or whether you don't like it, we will be involved. This little article comes from Signs of the Time, a little magazine, just a paragraph. It's powerful, and I don't want you, as we read it, I want you to stick it in the back of your mind. Would you do that? As we study along and go, and maybe it'll make a little more sense as we go. But notice what it says. It says, when we become children of God, what, might that, what does that mean to you? When we become children of God, does that mean when you give your life to Him? Or you say, when you talk to Christians today, say, well, I gave my life to Him, da-da-da-da, you know, or uh, I'm a Christian, uh, you know, I, I, I found Christ or something, you know, they'll go on. And When we become children of God, that means everybody who becomes a child of God accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior. Notice this, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Wow. And they remain there. Until the time of the investigative judgment. And I'll just put it right out. Right, We are in the time of the investigative judgment. The time of the, ju the judgment hour. In fact, I blow your mind with this. We have been in it for, ooh, what, 176 years. That's a long time. And we'll talk maybe more about it as we go. But we can find that out as we study the 2300-day year of prophecy in the Bible that we know these things because God has revealed them to us so that we can know. Because, you know, in the world today, if a person is on, and I think we're all on probation. Does that make sense? I know we accept Christ, and he said, well, your name's in the Lamb Book of Life. But it, it, there's a coming a time when God's going to say, is it worthy, your name worthy? Are you worthy to stay in the Lamb's Book of Life? And here are some records that we will look at to see whether you stay in it or whether you have to go. Interesting. We are in that time. It's already begun. If we don't know this subject, I'm telling you, it behooves us to get with the program and study. Amen. Now, I'll say this. Most Christians, most Christians, they just say they don't believe in an investigative judgment. Isn't that interesting? They don't believe in it. I've talked to so, so many. They say, no, man, we don't believe in investigative judgment because when Christ died, that just, that was it. Calvary, praise God for Calvary. 
We know the judgment hour has commenced as we look in, you know, in Revelation 14, the three angels' message. The hour of his judgment has come, is come, has come. They're taught. Many Christians are taught. This is interesting. They're taught not to believe in this subject. And I can't figure out why, and I think maybe you won't be able to figure it out. You're saying how? Because there's so much information in the Word of God, we only have time to share a little bit of it. But there'll be enough that you surely would shake your head and say, why are preachers not preaching on this subject? Because as I mentioned, as if you are on probation, you want to, they always say this, we want to keep your nose clean. You don't want so much as a parking ticket because the eye of the law is on you. Just take it like that. So we want everything to be, you know, up and up and, and right on target. So if we believe that we're in the last days of earth's history, there's an investigation going on to whether our names remain. And remember, we're talking about just the ones that gave their life to Christ, not those who have not. All right, this comes at a different time. We'll talk more about that as we go. But if it should remain in the Lamb's book of life, if you really think that, and we know, and we'll read it as we go, that it begins with the living, the, you know, the, the ones who were first born, with, with Adam. It begins in the house of God first. Those who are dead. And then it passes over to the living. And I often say, just good food for thought, what if we are in that time of the living? It seemed we could be in very well in the judgment of the living. All the dead passed by all these years. And then, now God doesn't need all this time. Everything that we're going to talk about here, please keep in mind, God is doing this for you and me. Does that make sense? He doesn't need all of this, the books and all the records and da-da-da. He's got it down pat. But he's thinking about you and me. Just make it quick here. I, if my mother makes it to heaven and I don't, she's going to want to know why I didn't make it and vice versa, and so on and so forth. We'll have that opportunity. So keep those thoughts in mind. What he's doing and what he did and what he's doing and will do is for you and me. Yes. Praise God for that. What a God that we serve. But again, people are teaching that you don't believe that. There's no such thing as investigative judgment, even though it's found even in several parables in the Bible. And I'll just mention uh, Matthew uh, 18, you can look, at Matthew chapter 22, these are parables that talk about the investigated the judgment hour and what it's all about. There's several verses that speak about the judgment. So I'm saying again, why would we say we don't need to know about that? Or it's not something that's in Scripture when it is. In fact, in fact, Hebrews 9, 27, you want to jot it down. We know the Bible says it is appointed unto men. Notice this once to die. So that means we're not going to live forever in this world, isn't it, right? Everybody's a point. There's a time that you're going to die. But notice this. But after what? After this, the judgment. Everyone's, we're born, we're here, then we die. But after that is the judgment. Again, whether we like it or whether we don't, we're going to have to say face the music of your life and my life. Listen, if you think it doesn't make sense, even our court system, oh, can I say this, as corrupt as they may be at times. Praise God for those who are staying with the program, and there are good ones. But you have to say, too, even in our court system today, we look at it, wor the, it works after the principles in the Word of God. The principles are there. Example, someone commits a crime. Okay, you say, now, what do you do? Oh, they committed a crime. Okay, let's execute them. And no, what, do you, what usually happens? Are they arrested? Yeah, and they're put in... Jail, possibly, and then there's an investigation to see whether they're guilty or innocent. Isn't that true? That's exactly what's going on in the Bible. We have committed a crime, as it were. We've sinned against God. We're all under the death penalty because sin is a transgression of the law, and the penalty is death. So we can look at it and say, oh, my, yeah, there's a crime. So before a person can be supposed to be sentenced and put in prison... You have to have, you know, you have to have a, you know, people to examine everything that took place. You've got to look at it and say, first of all, there has to be a, you know, before he's put on trial, he has to be tried and then convicted. There has to be evidence. That makes sense to me, at least. Whether he's guilty or whether he is innocent. Well, you know, Acts 17, 30, verse 31 says this. 
God hath appointed a day in which he will do what? Judge the world. Now, I'm just saying, when people say there is no judgment, we don't have to worry about it. What are we going to do with these passages? Are we just going to ignore them? You can't do it. God hath appointed a day which he will judge the world. That makes pretty good sense to me. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says this. For, notice this. For we all must what? Good. We all must come. We must all appear before the judgment seat. Isn't that right? We all must. That everyone may receive the things done in his body, whether it be good or bad. Now, if we really think about it, we might act a little bit better. That every thought, every action, everything, there's nothing secret. You might keep it from man, but you don't keep it from God. And I'll mention this here, and we can bring it out, and we can prove it later on if we have more time in which to do it. You'll record it. I believe that we have an angel with us. When we're born, there's one that's appointed with us. And that angel does more than keep you from bumping your little head when you're waddling around trying to walk, and you look like you, well, anyway, you stagger and fall. I think sometimes I, the angel's hand is put between the coffee table. Come on, somebody. And the head of that child. Just a little small example. But that, re, that angel is a recording angel. They don't make mistakes. They write down everything that you say, everything you do, and even goes into the motives of the heart. So there's a record that's kept of everything, whether it be good or evil. Wow. That's what the Bible says, doesn't it? That everyone may receive the things done in his body, whether it be good or evil. Revelation 20, verse 12, the Bible says, notice this, and the books were open. What about these books? What kind of books are we talking about here? We're open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. Wow. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The challenge is, what, what kind of works are we displaying today in our life? You know, what is it? your life? You know, somebody says, is our life just a sham? Is it just a make-believe? Or is it real McCoy that we realize we're here for a purpose? We realize here that God is looking at everything, not, not trying to say, oh, so we can condemn you here, but to be fair. God is fair, right? God is just. God is good. The judgment was set and the books were open. We're living in the great day of atonement. We're living in the great day of atonement. Jesus is completing his last works before he comes. This is why the devil wants most people to believe there is no investigative judgment. There is no judgment hour. He wants you to go ahead and live in... Oh, I'm very careful, Kenny. He wants you to go, the devil wants you to go ahead and live for him. Be occupied in the world and the things of the world and spending our time foolishly and doing that. You're going to have to give and I'm going to have to give an account of every second of our life. Is, is, is that going too far? That's fair, isn't it? Because I might want to say, well, I'm going to take all these seconds out here because I wasn't doing the right thing. Oh. Every second. Now, again, that's not just trying to be, oh, God's just pointing. Back. It's, he's fair. Right? In the court system, they say, let's get all the information in first. Before we can make a judgment, they're on there. Somebody's just been shot. We hear it all the time on there. And the guy will say, well, I can't say, I can't make a comment on that right now because we're, it's under, somebody say investigation. It's under investigation. We've got to check to see before we, you know, before the final decision is carried out. We're living in that day of atonement right now, but it, it's serious very serious because your life is on the line and mine's on the line. It's impressive with the events that are connected with the closing work of the judgment where Jesus is involved. You need him and I need him desperately. Heaven will never be your home without Jesus. You know, somebody can belittle it wherever they want. They can say it doesn't matter what it is. I hear people sometimes, well, I'm my own man. I do what I want here, and nobody helps me. God doesn't help me. It's a wonder he's not struck dead. Is that okay to say that? Yes. And there's those who, you know, shake your fist up to heaven and to God and say, now take this. Don't they realize they don't know who they're talking about? How great that he is and gracious and goodness and long-suffering with us as a people. But this hour is very impressive. It's very, the, all the events that are connected with it. How important is this subject? That would be a good question. Again, I mentioned at the beginning, how important is it? Because every person will be involved. You will be involved. I will be involved. Man, that's, that's pretty personal. 
And it concerns the very last work that Jesus is doing, notice, in the heavenly sanctuary, huh? in behalf of man. Oh, if you figure this, and I'll talk a little more about it as we go, if you think that it ended at the cross and there's nothing else, you're confused. You're confused. No, I know that'll upset some, but bless you, you have to love me anyway. Right? We've got to love one another. Isn't that right? Maybe a little different. Maybe you've never heard it. Maybe it's never been preached on you know, in your life. It's not those of you who have heard it many times. We're looking at reaching people around the world that's never heard it before. And they need to hear it. I need to hear it again. I learn every time I read the books and put things together. I'm saying, oh, Lord, have mercy. It affects my heart and my life. Because Jesus is doing his very last work that he's going to be able to do for you and for me right now. Huh. Now remember, Christians deny it because they say what? It ended at the cross. So if you believe it ended at the cross and there's nothing else beyond that, then you're in trouble. We need to go back to the teachings of God's Word. Listen, that came very close to home in the Seventh-day Adventist movement in the 50s. Is any, some of you are not with me. Okay, well, in the 50s, the evangelicals challenged this belief in Adventism of the investigative judgment. In fact, I can tell in 1957, I better be careful with it. It was challenged and it upset and some people just didn't quite get it all what was going on. And we had to really look at our positional stance on this subject and had to reword some things in order to... Okay. The Bible teaches an investigative judgment. It's only fair that God looks at our life. Remember, it's the time that we're born until we die and to be able to make a fair, righteous judgment. Hmm. I like that song, He's Ever Interceding. Yeah. People have a hard time with a, a heavenly sanctuary talked about. Now remember, the earthly sanctuary was laid out. If people only understood it, very few people in other faiths beyond ever study the sanctuary. We mentioned it many times. It's true. They don't study the earthly sanctuary. If you, listen, study the earthly sanctuary and what took place in there, you will see exactly what's taking place in heaven. The principles of what God, what Jesus is doing in behalf of mankind right now. They did it in the earthly, you see. Jesus is at what? Using his blood, his death, right, rather than that of animals. It's a beautiful thing when you really look at it and say, man, what a Savior that we have. If we are to benefit from Christ, where did he go, by the way? We realize that he, Calvary, he died. He was buried. He rose again. Isn't that right? Okay, after he rose, what did he do? I know some of you say, well, he went into the town. of. I know. <laughs> he did go in, didn't he? And he, he, he spent some time, didn't he? But we're talking about after that, what did he do? Where did he go back to? He went back to heaven, did he not? So all, we, every, almost every Christian understands that. That he rose, and he said, you know, as he's rising, I'm going to come back. The way you see me go, that's the way I'm going to come back. But he went back to his Father in heaven, notice, to complete the work that he started on Calvary. If you, study, if, if you haven't studied the earthly sanctuary, you're, you're not going to get it. What did the priest do? Remember, after the blood, the sacrifice representing Jesus Christ, he took that blood and he went into the, right, he sprinkled that blood, he applied that blood so it was, right, so that it applied. Now, he, in the heavenly, right, as it were, he's applying himself, his body. When my name comes up, he's saying what? Ooh, glory, right? If Jesus is not there to say okay to God, God is standing, God is sitting. We're going to read those verses. It, 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 oh, there's just so much to do. Should have done two or three parts, to be honest. I like that again. He's ever interceding in our behalf. He's applying his blood for our forgiveness of sin and for the blotting out of our sins. Man, I'm telling you, that's heavy duty. Isaiah 43 talks about it like this, 25. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy what? Transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. What a beautiful promise that is. The time will come, he said, I'm going to blot out the sins of your life, and I'll not bring them up to you ever again. I'm going to treat you as though you have never sinned. Where do you get that in this life? You don't get it. You're not even close to that. But he said, I, the time will come, I will blot them out. But you have to be faithful, and I have to be faithful for that blotting to take place. So I'm saying today, we should let nothing, nothing interfere 
with our seeking to know and our seeking to understand the sanctuary and the investigative right, judgment. Listen, which must clearly be understood by God's people. So get this. We must clearly understand this subject. Now, some of you are not. Somebody turn the air down. There's not going to be no sleeping in here. Somebody with me? Well, that's usually what happens when we get a little bit hot and tired, isn't that right? Now, we're talking about eternal salvation here. We should be on the edge of our seats, regardless if we know it or not. Our eternal destiny, your name could have already come up. It could come up tomorrow. It could come up next week. I'm just saying that it can. And when it comes up, there will be pronounced whether heaven's going to be your home or not. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's heavy duty. Because he's not going to go back and change it. He doesn't have to. Because we, as we read here, we'll see here in the morning. I, to me, the, the old people talks about all the time, they'll say, I need to wrap my head around that. That just means we need to right, evaluate it, right, really think about it deep. I need to wrap my head. I need to really wrap it around and say, man, what is this talking about? Why do I need to understand this? Because it would be impossible for anyone here, any place in the world, to exercise the faith that we need to exercise, you know, to occupy the place that God has designed for every one of his children. See, we haven't seen anything yet. If you're struggling right now, if you're going on back and forth and carrying on and, duh, I tell you, well, there's nothing on the shelves, there's this and that. No one's done without any meals here yet, I don't think. Still have a roof over your head, right? We've still been blessed is what I'm saying of God. He's going to continue to bless if we do the right thing. That's what he said I'd do. I'm going to take care of you. We need not worry about the conditions of the world. We need to be aware of them to tell us the sneerness of the coming of Jesus. But man, have confidence and faith and trust in God's word that he said, I will take care of you. Oh, it's beautiful to know that. Wrap our heads around that scene of the judgment and what is taking place. And the books are open. And in those books, there's a name. And it may be your name and my name. You think that's not heavy duty? If all of heaven looks at that book and your name is on it. And everything can be discussed, as it were, that you don't want people to know. Whew. The Bible said whether it be good or evil. Is that right? Are we that close to the coming of Jesus? Are we there? Keep this in mind, please. And I'm going to repeat it and probably repeat it and repeat it. Because, well, you guys are not that way, but I am. I have to repeat several times before I finally get it through here. You've heard this many, many times, but let it really soak this time. Let's digest it. Let's tear it apart. Let's really look at this. The great controversy, page 488 and 489, where it says this. The intercession of, come on, see you smile. The intercession of Christ... Right? In man's behalf in the sanctuary, notice this, above, is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death on the cross. Does anybody get that? You see, the world said, well, his death on the cross. Yeah, praise God. That's complete and full at that point. Does that make sense? At that point, yeah, perfect. Praise God. But there's more to it. The earthly sanctuary tells there was more to it. After the shedding of blood, after the death, then the blood was taken and applied. But who can it be applied to? Not going to just apply to everyone. It's going to be applied to those who are willing to follow Jesus, you know, wherever he leads. It's interesting when we look at that. Are we getting that? This subject is just as important because they go together. You can't separate them. Yeah, we talk about the cross. Praise God. We talk about sacrifice. Praise God. But we've got to talk about him completing the work. And that's being there in the completion form. I hope I can say that all right. Hmm. We know he died for our sins. Is that right? I, probably no Christian would probably deny that. He died for our sins. That's good. But remember, it, it was after his death, after he died, remember, that he began another work. As he rose and came out of the tomb. So he couldn't, he couldn't begin the work, you know, until Calvary. Calvary then, what death that was able him then as he rose to begin another form of that work for our salvation. Huh. 
He went back into heaven. Notice what it said. The book of Hebrews chapter 6 verse 20 says this. He must by faith enter within the veil. Whether the forerunner is for us entered. The forerunner. Jesus. Isn't that right? Where's he gone? He went back into heaven, right? He's already entered in there. He's begun his work. He didn't just go up there to set. He said, well, he's on the right hand of the Father. Well, what a, ooh, I almost said, what a boring life. He just, just sat all the time. None of us even here want to sit all the time. Isn't that right? No. Being seated means he was beginning right, a process. When the Father right, was seated, it began a process. So the sanctuary in heaven, we know this, the sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work in behalf of you and me. Does that make sense? It involves us. But see, the world doesn't basically know that, and they don't want to stay, and I can't figure out why. But they can sing the songs, he's ever interceding. Why do you go back to heaven? Because he's my mediator. We can all say that. There's more to it than that. The Bible speaks so much about the investigative judgment as we look at it today. And again, why most Christians reject it. I say, I don't know why, because it's so scriptural. Right? It, it, you don't have a hard time finding this subject in Scripture. It's very scriptural. Could it be that the devil doesn't want us to understand it? Could it possibly be that he's always working to make sure that we don't quite get it or the importance of it? Now, in your Bible in Daniel chapter 7, 9 and 10, let's read. Here we're going to see, notice coming together, a court. A court coming together in heaven or the judgment hour. Revelation 14, that first angel's message. Isn't that right? Notice how it reads and just see if you, you come up. Get your mind open right now. No matter if it's been closed before, please open it right now. Daniel chapter 7, a prophet of God. Man, what a man of God. Daniel 7, 9 and 10. 9 says, notice Daniel says, yeah, I beheld, says the prophet Daniel, till the thrones were what? Yeah, yeah placed, cast, set down. And notice what happened. And the, in other words, the courtroom got ready. Are you still with me? You know, in the court, you know, you have come in, you look in a picture of the courtroom today. What do you see? You see a bunch of chairs, and sometimes the camera goes on and shows those empty seats. This is where those who are in charge is going to be sitting. They're going to give the verdict. Yeah, the jurors. After the, after the information is given so they can make an intelligent decision, notice that he beheld that until the Ancient of Days did sit. Who's the Ancient of Days? God. The courtroom all got ready. Right? All the angels were there. We'll read that thousands, ten thousand, thousands of thousands. We can't even number them. Notice this. You know why? Because they're witnesses. The witnesses were called. They said they spent their whole life with you. Right? That angel spent their whole, your whole life. They spent it with you, jotting down everything so it would be fair because they want you in heaven. Not leaving anything out that's good, but they have to apply that which is bad too. The Ancient of Days did sit. Notice this. His garment was white as snow. His hair on his head was like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. Verse 10, notice Daniel 7. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. I like this. Woo, thousand, thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand Time ten thousands stood before him. Notice this. The judgment was set and the books were open. See sermon title? What happened? Right? They got all the seating. Everything was ready. All the witnesses were called in. and that what they do? Fill up the courtroom. All is here. And then God the Father comes in. Here come the judge. Is that okay? That's exactly what it is. Here come the judge. The judge of the universe. And then he was seated, but then all of a sudden there was some more commotion going on. And all of a sudden, here comes Jesus. Here comes the lawyer. Here comes the one that's, that's, that's graving you on the palms of his hands. He knows you by name. He calls you by name. He knows everything about you. And unless he stands up for you, heaven not going to be your home. Because none of us can earn it. None of us can work it. None of us can go to church every seventh day and think we go to church on Sabbath. Hey, we're going to make it. That doesn't mean diddly. Can I say diddly, Jan? That means nothing. That doesn't mean anything. There's got to be more than that. My brothers and sisters, please think about it. I've, I've talked to so many people over the years that they think that this, I go to certain, certain church and that's, I just make it. No. It's not by denomination. You know that. Not by church attendance. It's much more than how's your relationship with Jesus Christ. Brother Ben was playing and singing. Is he the sinner? 
He has to be the center or heaven's not going to be our home at all. It just can't be. You think about all the angels with the witnesses and then all of a sudden something happens. The judgment was set and all of a sudden these books were opened. Wow. What about all those books? Does God need books? No. Does he need all the witnesses? No. He doesn't need any of this, but he knows that if by God's grace I get, I'm going to need it. My children's going to need this to really understand what took place. My children need this so that they'll understand that every person on this planet got a fair shake. Is that good enough we can understand it? They got a fair shake. That he doesn't pick somebody over the other like we do in this world today. We're a respecter of persons. He is not. We need to be careful about that. Here in the Bible, Daniel, well, here the prophet saw a time when the lives of all men would pass before the great judge of the earth. Hmm. And he's going to bring, notice this, into account every, we mentioned every moment of your life, my life. Now, according, now the Bible says according to their deeds. Did you get that? Or according to their uh, works. And Romans 2, 6 is another passage. It's according, my grandpa used to say, how you act. He'll put you out in the cornfield and see how you act. And if you acted well, he gave you more work to do. If you didn't act very good, he said, don't come out here. A little different maybe, but here we're talking about, we see how we're going to act. By our deeds, it says here. So how are your deeds? How are your works today? Are you just a gossiper and a backbiter and a criticizer and a complainer and a griper? I'm going to say this right here. That won't be in the kingdom. Does that, does that make sense? Let's get down to the nitty-gritty of what goes on even in churches sometimes. There's division. There's separation. There's gossiping. There's backbiting. There's carrying on. And that's not carried out the way the principles of here because a lot of times we, we do the backbiting and the cannibalism when that person's not around. Hmm. You've got to have evidence. Well, somebody said that's not evidence. God doesn't use that. Does that make sense? He doesn't use that in the judgment. The angel said. Somebody said. Daniel saw. The angel, he said, wrote this in a book. And they don't make mistakes. Oh, wow. So who's, who's the, the ancient of days? We all said, we said, yes, it is God. But notice the Bible says in Psalms 90, verse uh, two, 2, I think it is. Psalms 90, verse 2. It says, before the mountains were formed, did you get it, huh? Were brought forth, and even thou hast formed the earth and the world. Before all of this took place right here, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. There never was a time. Don't ask me to explain how he got here. I got, can I say I'll go deaf and dumb so that we get the message? Can you explain how God got here? There's no one that can do it. Uh, ooh, I almost said only a fool would try I mean, really, think about it. You, 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 we don't know. That's too much. Don't try to spend time on those things that's so far above us. We'll understand, ooh, we'll understand it better by and by. Remember that song? We'll understand it better by, by the grace of God. If we get to heaven, these things will be explained to us over the ceaseless ages. How wonderful that will be. And Jesus will sit down and talk to you like there's nobody else there. Because, he got, as you say, he got all the time in the world. Isn't that wonderful to think about? Not been in a hurry to worry about time. Oh, praise God. Psalms 93 brings it out, verse 2. It says, Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. So we realize he's just always been. You've got, you have to know that there's somebody that's in control. Somebody that's in charge. Somebody that can take nothing and make something. Who else can do that? If I want to build something, I go to the lumber yard and start buying some lumber. He doesn't have to do that. He can make his own number if he wants to. You see, you follow me. Micah 5, verse 2, the Bible says, Yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is like the ruler of Israel. Notice, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Isn't that wonderful to know? He's always been, and he always will be. So in this, let's get to the courtroom setting. It kind of gives you chills sometimes if you think about it. If you were on trial and you were sitting in that seat. And all these high-paid people trying to prove you're guilty. 
because you omitted something, maybe by accident, or somebody said you did and you didn't, you wasn't even there. That's pretty heavy duty to leave your life, as it were, in the hands of a man. But this is not the case. Your life is in the hands of God and the angels, and they're only going to refer to what you said or what you did. The courtroom setting, I love it. 10,000 times 10,000 attend this. This is a court of justice, not just a mockery court like a lot of them on this earth is. It's not a mockery at all. It's a court of justice. It's a seat of judgment. This is where it all takes place. Daniel 7, 13 and 14, the Bible said, I saw in the night vision. Come on, church. I saw in the night vision. Behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days. Do you see this? A court setting. God's there seated, and all of a sudden there's something else takes place here. Here comes Jesus, and he came before the Father. He's standing between what? Us and the Father. You can't stand before the Father. I can't stand before the Father. And let me tell you this. We will probably won't get into it tonight. Remember, you will not be there in person. Because a lot of you did. You ooh, I almost said salesman. You tried to talk your way out of it. Well, when things don't go our way, don't we try to talk our way out of things sometimes? Well, we did it because I saw the preacher. I saw Sister Jean acting up. So I thought I could do it too. There's not going to be any of that because every th everything is written in a book. You don't need anything else. And they brought him near before him. Notice verse 14. And there was given to him. Notice what happened when Jesus came in to the Father. Jesus was given, notice, dominion, verse 14, glory, and a kingdom. Oh, good. That all people, all nations and language should serve him. His dominion is that what? Everlasting dominion. You need to join something. I need to join something that's everlasting. It's not going to come to an end. This world's going to come to an end. No matter how rich you are, no matter if you think you've got the, the bull by the horns, you don't have. You'll find you had him by the... Something else. I don't know. Tail or something. I don't know what to tell you. And his kingdom, that which should not be destroyed. I want to be a part of that, don't you? We're very confused, I think. Keep this in mind. You look at these verses, and many people have tried this. Pull this shenanigan, and don't let them get away with it. Truth makes a difference in this world. It doesn't mean we have all truth. We understand everything there is to be understood. But there's things that you can study like hidden treasure, and you can dig things out if you're willing. There's just surface readers today, millions of surface readers. We've got to dig deep. The coming of Jesus Christ in these verses we just read is not the second coming. It is not the second coming of Christ that is talking about here. Notice what he does. Where, where does Jesus come? The Bible just said he came to the ancient of days who was seated in heaven. That makes sense? Yeah. He was seated in heaven. So what did he do? He, Jesus was there to receive power and glory and to receive his kingdom. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. To receive his kingdom. Put in charge, as it were, of that. We know this because we study Bible prophecy. Study Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 9. You had 2,300-day prophecy. You know where Christ is at. You know when he's, when he's working in behalf of his people. You know when he moved from the holy to the most holy place to begin his last phase of you know, work before he comes back here. And this is what he's doing right now. The last phase, and some of us are monkeying around like we've got forever. Steve, can I say monkeying around? I mean, sometimes I just get carried away. I don't mean to. It's just like it comes. That's, that's what I always think. Is when you're monkeying around, it means you're wasting your time. We're wasting our time. We think we've got, you know, years. Oh, we'll get this all figured out here. You don't know what you've got a year. You don't know you've got tomorrow. I don't know that I've got tomorrow, but I want to say what's on my heart today. I don't have to say, well, I wish I had another day. Blah, blah, blah. Say it. Too much monkeying around right now. We've got to get down to business. What did Christ do? Remember in 1844, right at the end of the 2300 days, what did he do? He moved from the holy place to the most holy place. Why? Because we studied the earthly sanctuary and we seen the priest, isn't that right? He went into the holy place, isn't that right? And one time a year he went where? The cleansing of the sanctuary, right? The atonement. One time a year he went into the most holy place to do his last work before he comes back. Woo, he's ever, ever interceding. He's standing before the Ten Commandment law of God that the most in the world say it's been done away with. No! No, it's not. Everybody, most Christians will agree, nine is okay. They just want to somehow evade and get away from the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's the seventh day of the week. You can't call Sunday Sabbath because it's not. Is that okay? I'm going to be bold. 
It's not. So no one should get angry about it. It's just not. Sabbath means Saturday, right? Rest. Seventh day, the Bible said, I can't make it any clearer than that. God couldn't make it any clearer than that. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. If it's good enough for him, maybe it should be good enough for me, don't you think? He made his move to begin his last work we talked about here. So what? Two things, just quickly. Two things there. He began the investigative phase of the judgment. And then he was going to make, finish the atonement. See, you have to have that finishing. And how can he give that finishing to you if he don't investigate or look into the lives of everything we said and done, our deeds of this life? You can't pass sentence. You just can't. This makes sense. We need to remember this. And then his atonement will be applied to those, notice it, who are entitled to it. That who's accepted him as Lord and Savior and remain faithful to him. It's not once saved, always saved. It just can't be. It's just, that's not a doctrinal teaching at all. But it's what men likes to chew up because it's kind of sweet in their mouth. Well, I, blah, blah. I haven't been to church in 20 years. I've been living like the devil. But hey, I was saved when I was 10. Ha. Huh. You know what I'm saying? I mean, really, that, really that, no, that's nowhere near Bible teaching at all. So that's what, really, that's what bothers me. It's not the wrongness or rightness or you're better, you got this right. It's just they're hoodwinked. They're deceived. And your job and my job, just like Jesus when he came to this earth, what was his job? He was to attack evil and error in Scripture and to bring home the truth. That's what he wants you to do today. If you're not doing that, dear friend, we're not doing what God wants us to do. Final, you know, atonement and investigative judgment. Wow. And remember, only those who are considered at this point we're talking about are the professed people of Christ. The wicked are not even considered at this point in time. Did you get it right? It's only those who profess to be. So when somebody says, I'm a professed Christian, that may not mean deadly. May not mean anything. But your life will prove whether you are or not, right? By your works, by your deeds, right? Yeah, fruits, you're going to be, no, no. Because the, the judgment of the wicked is a distinct, it's, a, it's different and it's, it's separate and takes place at a later time. Can't go into all that, be maybe more confusing for you. The judgment begins as 1 Peter 4, 17. If there is no judgment, why does it say here? Judgment begins, must begin at the house of God. That's what Peter says. Peter talks about it. Paul talks about it. Micah talks about it. Daniel talks about it. John talks about it. Come on. All of this, they talk about the judgment. So who do we say there is none? Jesus talked about it. Thank you, and We'll give the best to last, right? Jesus. So what is used? Quickly, what is used to determine the decisions in the judgment? What is used to determine the decisions in the judgment? Or what is used as evidence? Somebody say the books. The books that are kept in heaven by, I said, by a recording angel. Our names and our deeds are in these recorded. Daniel says it like this. Quickly, let me read Daniel 7, verse 10. He said, the judgment was set and the books were opened. All right, evidence, here it is. Is Kenny going to make it? Is he not? Here's the evidence. Every word he's ever said, every thought, every deed, every good or bad, it's all right here. John, the Reve in the Revelation, he says it like this. Describes the, kind of the same event he's describing here in Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. He said, another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Does that make sense? Are we making sense? Need to keep reading it? No. Only those whose names are written where? In the Lamb's book of life are examined right now. Read that, John uh, uh, 21, verse 27. Read it. For yourself to know, Jesus understood this truth that was brought out when he said in Luke 10, verse 20. He said, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Don't you like that? How many of us really rejoicing because our names are written in heaven? Most of us, we don't even think about that. Rejoice, be exceedingly glad. Don't go around long-faced and depressed and torn up all the time. Somebody needs to rejoice. Isn't that right? Rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. It's written in heaven. Nobody can take it away from you. Some board may throw you out here. Somebody may disfell oh my. disfellowship you right in this life here. But make sure it's written in the Lamb's book of life. I want that to make sense. If it's written down there, no man can take you out of his hand. 
At Daniel 12, 1, you remember Daniel talks about it, speaking of a time of trouble coming on this world such as never was. You remember that? But it says, every one of God's people shall be delivered. Every one. You're not going to be left out if you're really God's person. You're people, whatever. If you accepted him as Lord and Savior. But notice this. It says, if, if you, you know, people shall be delivered. Now notice who are delivered. The verse goes on, every one that shall be found written in the book. Daniel knew about writing in the book. David knew about writing in the book. Psalms, he wrote about the book. These passages of scripture, Micah knew about it. All of these people knew about it. And yet today, people don't know about it. They're told not to. Found, notice this, they that feared the Lord and thought upon his name. Anybody fear the Lord? Reverend, yeah, amen. Yeah, and we think upon his name. Amen. Praise God for that. Written in the book. No, it's written in that. You want to know what's written in that book? Every act of faith that you have done for Jesus Christ is written in that book. All deeds of righteousness that were done are written there. Every temptation that God gave you, you know, ability to, to resist it and gain the victory is written there. Acts of kindness and love that you've shown to your neighbors and your friends. Acts of sacrifice and giving for the cause, the cause of the gospel. Our suffering and our sorrow and our tears and all the mess that we go through in this life, if it's done for Christ's sake, it's written in the book. The psalmist wrote, Psalms 56, 8, Thou tellest my wanderings, but, thou, but put thou my tears into thy bottle. Notice this. Are they not in thy book? He knew it too. Oh, there is also, <laughs> that's just so good. There's also a book kept of the sins that we have committed. Ecclesiastes 12, 14, the Bible says, For God shall bring every work into judgment, whether in secret, a secret thing or whether it be good, whether it be evil. Matthew chapter 12, 36, 37, Jesus says, Every idle word. Somebody needs to listen. There's an awful lot of idle words that's going out today. They're not needed. It says we must give an account for every idle word. You need to decide what that, uh, that idle word might be. Is it something as a word in due season, or is it not, or is it just da 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 We must give an account by the words... The Bible says, by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words shalt thou be what? Condemned. This will include selfish acts, how selfish sometimes that we are. It's duty that maybe is left undone. God has given you a duty. He's given you a commission. Is it left undone, or are you going to fulfill that by God's grace and strength? I tell you, we better, because those things are listed in there. He's given us duty. We've got to do it. How about our secret sins that are listed in there? How about the warnings that we've neglected over and over? You hear it in the pulpit. You read them yourself. Warning, warning, let's not do, let's do that. And sometimes we don't. Corrections that are neglected. Wasted time. Wasted time. Wasted time. Get off the computers. Get off the phones. Unless it's important that you need to do something with them. There, 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 there's a good, there are good things to have. But to constantly sit around. You can't walk down the street that you don't have it on. You just can't do anything unless it's going on. You can't just do anything. You're just going, 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 going all the time. You can't do anything. You can't go. You can't be seated in a restaurant with your family. Every one of them's got this. Blah, blah, blah. I'm getting carried away with it. I can't help it because it just so aggravates me. No respect. I've often thought, and I will do it eventually, not just a threat. If we go eat with so somebody or whatever, and they're going to spend their time on the phone, I'm leaving. Have enough respect, you see. Yeah, but why? Because a lot of this is wasted time. When it's needed, praise God, it's all good. There's nothing wrong with being on it, I'm saying. But there's times that just put them down. Enjoy the moment, as it were. Well, we don't have time to go into a few points I'd like to bring out. The righteous will not be raised until after the judgment. Interesting. The righteous will not be raised till after the judgment. Why? So they can be accounted worthy of the resurrection. You know that? Right. Remember when God says, remember, all this takes place before Jesus comes. It's taking place right now. Because he says, when I come, Revelation, I've got to close. Revelation says, when I come, I bring my reward with me to give every man according as his work. Isn't that right? Yes. When he comes, it's all finished. Yes. Think about it. It's all done. How will you be? How will you stand? The judgment was set and the books are open. Your life is going to be made, right? As far as heaven's concerned, public record. Or we can confess our sins and he's faithful and just to forgive us. Amen. And you might have a book. I'm just talking. You may have a book with your name written on it. But the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed everything. You open that book and it's just white pages. Woo! Every record, every deed, everything we've ever done has been covered by the blood of the Lamb. And may I say this before we close. 
If you've left one sin unconfessed, it will come back, I'm going to put it this way, to bite you and keep you out of heaven. Every sin must be confessed and sent to the heavenly sanctuary where Christ can make atonement with his blood. And then heaven can be our home. Why not do that? Why not do that? It's so simple now to say, Lord, forgive me of my sins, right? And then I want to live the life for you. I want to do the right thing, and he will do that. Will you make that decision with me today? Because I'm very much well aware of the judgment was set and the books were open. Where's your name written as we close with prayer? Where's your name written? Is it in the Lamb's Book of Life, or are you more concerned that it's written in a church book somewhere? I know people get aggravated at me, but, you know, it's true. The most important thing is in the, written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And if you haven't made that choice and decision today, why don't you make it right now? So we have prayer for you. Is there anyone who'd like to say, pray for me? I want to make sure my name is written in that Lamb's Book of Life. I'll be the first to raise my hand. Pray for me. I want my name written in that Lamb's Book of Life. If it's not written there, you're not going to go to heaven. You're going to go to hell. May I just say, it? Just, that's, that's the way it is. There's two choices. And that's not to scare anybody, but you know, I want heaven to be my home, and I know you do too. Is there anyone again who wants to say, I want you to pray for me. I want to make sure my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. God can do that, can He? He wants to do it. Let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven. And we thank you for your precious word. We realize sometime it, it kind of turns around and it seems to bite us, but it, it does. it's just trying to get our attention to help us to realize that you're coming soon. Help us to realize that we're in this hour of the judgment. Help us to realize that our names are coming up and sentence will be pronounced right then and there. We won't know it. The world will go on maybe for a little while, but we won't know. Just as they didn't at the time of the flood, this gives us an example. Probation had closed for the world seven days before it started to rain. The door of the ark was closed, but everything had been judged. Everything had been done. And Lord, how do we know that it's not done now or close to it? Just help us to be ready, Lord. You've seen the hands and the hearts of those who said, I want my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And Lord, it would be just a disastrous thought to think there'd be someone here, someone to sound the voice, Someone to listen to the DVDs or whatever it might be, CDs or whatever, and just say, well, it doesn't really matter. I don't have to take a stand. Bless your heart. It makes a difference. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the information you've left us so that we can be, spend eternity with you. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello and welcome back. The judgment of God is certainly no laughing matter. It is very serious. It is a subject that we need to put more study time into and learn more about, there's no doubt. In a real sense, we are all on probation. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He's allowing us a probationary time to see if we've learned our lesson or our lessons about sin and have had a real change of heart in accepting the righteousness of Christ through true repentance and a complete, a complete turning away from sin. Then and only then may our heavenly records of sin be blotted completely out through the blood of the Lamb. I don't believe that we've ever fully comprehended or that we ever will fully comprehend what a heavenly gift has been offered us through the Lamb of God in this life. But certainly, certainly we have heart-filled and Holy Spirit convictions to watch and to learn about this Lamb and to follow Him whithersoever He should lead each and every one of us. Our message for today was entitled, The Judgment Was Set, The Books Opened. And it is now available to order from Behold the Lamb Ministries on DVD or CD for just a love gift of $8 or more. We look so forward to hearing from you and to receive your orders or your love gifts in support of this ministries. You may reach us here in the United States at 618-942-5044. That's Central Time. Or you may also mail in your request or support to Behold the Lamb Ministries, P.O. Box 2030, Heron, Illinois 62948. 
You may email us at contact at beholdthelambministries.com or visit us on our website at beholdthelambministries.com. And we encourage you, as always, to subscribe to our Behold the Lamb Ministries YouTube channels where you will find more of these messages that I'm sure will warm your heart and draw you closer to Jesus. And look for us on our Facebook page. And until next time, friends, join us here once again on 3ABN for Behold the Lamb Presents. May God continue to richly bless you and yours. Mm -hmm.